All right, welcome everybody. We're going to go ahead and get today's event um, kicked off. Appreciate all those of you um, who have joined us today uh, for today's webinar, Healthcare's Guide to Energy Management. My name is Earl Lang. Uh, I'm an integrated marketing manager here at the Dude, and I'm going to be moderating today's event. Um, really quickly, before we get into the bulk of today's presentation, just want to provide a few heads up and housekeeping items for you all. Phone lines have been muted for today's event. That's more to um, reduce background noise than anything. We don't want that to discourage communication or, or participation on your part, though. So please do use the Q&A and chat features. Um, if you have questions as, as Dan takes us through today's event, um, we'll be certain to address those as we go along or even follow up once we get to the Q&A portion at the end of today's event. Um, well, without further ado, I'll go ahead and kick it over to Dan, who's going to take us through the bulk of today's presentation. Dan? Awesome. Thanks, Earl. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for, for joining today. I know uh, things are unique right now, so hopefully we can have a fun fun conversation and, and, and learn a thing or two. So um, I guess just to introduce myself and to help you put uh, a face with uh, a name, uh, this is me, Dan Aran. I've been working with the dude uh, since 2013. I'm a certified energy manager. Um, my wife and I and two kids live in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, so, um, again, just really excited to to talk with you, um, share a little bit about what uh, we've learned over the years working with clients and just honestly kind of give us some practical steps when we talk about energy management um, in healthcare organizations. So, with that being said, pretty pretty uh, um, self-explanatory agenda today. Uh, I want to talk about what we're calling the five C's of energy management. <clears throat> and um, what I want us to take away from, from really just kind of the bulk of, of the presentation today uh, is just that, um, you know, having a process to manage uh, energy, to manage our utilities, uh, to identify waste, uh, it needs to be a simple, scalable process. And what I mean is, it, it doesn't matter if you're the energy or facility manager over, you know, one uh, hospital, uh, or if you're, you know, the facility or energy manager over a large network of clinics and, and statewide facilities, uh, the process is the same. The, the important part is, is the process. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that. And then of course, towards the end, um, I'm actually gonna leave a pretty good amount of time for, for Q&A. Um, like Earl had mentioned in an email before we started, uh, we had some technical difficulties and normally we'd have some poll questions kind of littered throughout um, the, the presentation today and, and weren't able to get those live. So, uh, so we'll, we'll kind of run through and, and then, and then uh, have some Q and A towards the end. So, and I guess before, before I do that, when we say Q and A, you'll notice uh, the chat box in your, um, you know, in your navigation bar. Uh, feel free to not hold your questions till the end, right? If there's uh, if there's something that you you want me to address, and in the in the middle of the presentation, um, don't feel like this is one of those kind of stuffy. Uh, you got to sit and listen to me drone on and not have any feedback or not have any any questions. Definitely interrupt, ask questions. Let's kind of keep this a, as much of a back and forth as possible, uh, even though the lines are muted uh, to to prevent some background noise. Um, so. With that being said, this is kind of the why uh, why we're here, what, what we're talking about. Um, I know the, the, the term healthcare organizations is very broad. We can talk about critical care, we can talk about acute care, we can talk about senior living, uh, we can talk about a, you know, a lot of different things, surgery centers, uh, administrative buildings. Um, and, and so I know this is broad, but the reality is honestly, probably for any organization, not, not just healthcare, uh, but, you know, your municipalities or school districts or manufacturing, uh, energy is, is one of the top cost centers that, that you deal with. In fact, I, I saw a study the other day that if we are talking specifically uh, hospitals, uh, it can be over 50% of your budget uh, towards utilities. Uh, and what's fascinating to me about that is it's, it's the budget line item that rarely has a managed process. Meaning um, there, there's this mentality of, well, you know, our utilities are a fixed cost. We've got to keep the lights on. We've got, um, you know, health mandates. We can't just turn down the, the AC or, or, or keep the lights off. 
Uh, so we just kind of pay the bill and move on. Um, and, and what's interesting is, you know, your utility line items make up about 16% of all of your controllable costs. In layman's terms, we can control it. We, we, we can't, you know, save 100%, right? But, but we can control and we can identify waste uh, in our facilities. So with that being said, I want to talk about how. Um, one second. Well, and, and, and what I want to talk about, I'm calling it the five C's like I mentioned. If you want to screenshot a slide, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave this up for a second because really this is kind of an agenda of what we're, we're talking about today, <clears throat> what I'm calling the five C's. The, the biggest things that I want to add here are um, this is the scalable process. So again, whether you're one facility or whether you're a large portfolio of facilities, whether you're just getting started kind of on your energy journey, if you will, uh, or whether it's something that you've, you know, you've had going on quite some time, you should still find savings in each of these categories. And, and Kristen, great question. Uh, Kristen just asked uh, folks, will the slides be available after? Absolutely. Uh, we'll send everyone kind of a, 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 a copy of the, of the presentation today, the recording, as well as, uh, as well as the slides. Thank, thanks for asking, Kristen. So with that being said, uh, let's really dive in and let's talk about some of these bullet points. Uh, let's talk about this flow, what we mean when we say clarity, culture, conservation, capital, and communication. So first things first, uh, let's talk about clarity. <clears throat> um, you know, this is, this is something that it can mean a lot of things, uh, but if I could, um, if I could just kind of simplify it into um, you know, uh, 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 answering two basic questions. In this phase, the best way to get started with, with inter any energy management program is just to better understand where you are, right? It's kind of like taking a snapshot of your organization. And I mean, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, you're, you're tracking your energy trends. Um, you're looking at utility bills. You're understanding, <clears throat> you know, high level, uh, how much it costs to run your facility, right? You're really just gathering information at, the, at this point. Uh, and so where I like to start with clarity, knowing there's a lot of things that we can look at, there's a lot of data that we can dig into. I like to break it up into really two basic questions, two, two basic questions that you should be able to answer uh, in this you know, stage, this first seed that we're calling clarity. Uh, you should be able to answer the question, number one, are we paying the right amount of money on our bills? And this is largely financial, right? These are things that can be done, um, you know, through rate audits with your utility providers. These are, these are things that can be done with the accounting team, you know, doing billing audits. Um, these are things that can be done sometimes in a spreadsheet, that, you know, depending on the size of your organization. But it's really the idea of kind of in your right hand, you know, holding March, of 2020's utility invoices and in your left hand, you know, at minimum holding March 2019, 2018, 2017 invoices in your left hand uh, kind of idea and comparing them. So, so we do this, we do this at our homes uh, most frequently is, you know, man, is this right? Or am I paying the right amount of money on this bill? Um, and so there's a lot of things that we can talk about when, when we talk about how to answer this question. Um, but, but step one, are we paying the right amount of money on our bills? Step two kind of kind of brings us into the operational side. Well, where are our dollars going? Right? I need to be able to answer, you know, if there's an opportunity, if I if I can identify waste somewhere, I want to be able to know where that is. Right? So, you know, again, this is scalable. This could be for one building, uh, this could be for a portfolio of facilities, but being able to say uh, you know, I know for certain times of year, I'm going to use the most and spend the most in my utilities um, for certain times of the day. Um, basic, basic question, where are my dollars going? And again, we're, we're not solving right now. We're just kind of getting the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, benchmarking is a great way to do this when we talk about step two operational. And when I say benchmarking, uh, right, you know, if you've got a large portfolio of facilities, this is, this is kind of bread and butter. I'm probably not saying anything new to many of you on the call, 
Um, but if you've got a large portfolio of facilities, just comparing them to one another, right? Assuming that they operate the same, if you've got multiple hospitals, multiple clinics, um, you know, residential uh, housing units for senior living uh, clients, Right, just the idea to be able to compare similarly occupied and operated facilities to basically say, where, where do I have waste? If these facilities are operated the same, um, if they are occupied similarly, I should be able to say which one is using, you know, the most uh, for the same time frame. Uh, but benchmarking can also be comparing uh, one facility to itself over a time frame. So very similar to kind of step one when we talked about the financial, I'm holding bills in my right hand, holding bills in my left hand, and I'm comparing them. It's the same thing uh, from a usage standpoint or even a cost standpoint to, to look at, you know, year over year trends or, you know, days of the month. Are there certain times in the month? Um, are there certain months of the year kind of idea? Um, what, where are my, this facility trending as I compare it to itself? Uh, do I have historical data? Um, so, so again, in the clarity, a great place to start is right here, step one, step two. Um, the, the, the last thing that I'll say on this, uh, on this bullet point of, of clarity, it's also a great, a great time to be able to see what data you don't have, right? We're, we're talking really about, you know, looking at, at data points like our utility bills, if you've got building automation systems, uh, looking at trending data, you know, sometimes we can look at meter data in 15 minute intervals, right? There's a lot of data that you can look at, but it's equally as important to note during this phase, not just what, what you do have access to, but what you don't. Do you need more granular data? Do we need to install submeters so that we can get more granular data? Um, I've seen this as an example with, with our senior living clients. Um, a lot of those communities are set up with, um, you know, having a master meter that serves the entire campus and really not knowing month over month which of their facilities, uh, you know, cause an increase, right, because they're all kind of tied to one big master meter. I've seen that in hospital campuses as well. Um, and so it's a great time to say, man, if I'm getting really serious about this and want to know where to act, I may need to do a, kind of a, a second level of investment and install some submeters. Uh, to really understand, you know, where my dollars are going. <clears throat> so moving into the to the second phase, if we're kind of following this progression, one, you know, we, we've talked about clarity, we've got data in front of us, we can answer questions about where our costs are going and, and maybe even what utility commodities are costing us the most. We, we've kind of got a snapshot, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And now I kind of want to take it into what we're calling culture. Um, what do we do with that data? And this is an area of, um, I would call it a hot topic. It, it's something where it, it's kind of nebulous in terms of how can I affect behavior change, right? That, that's probably one of the biggest questions. Um, you know, the operational side of our organization uh, makes up about 56% of our opportunity. Uh, so in terms of the people turning off lights or making sure our billing automation controls are scheduled correctly or honestly people just caring and, and so the culture part is one that i've seen a lot of great ideas uh, and a lot of good things and it's probably going to be organization by organization um, but energy star says that uh, 30 percent of the energy used in an average commercial building is wasted All right so so you know a third of what's being used and what you're paying for is just wasted um, and so we, we kind of look at that and say, well, well how can we act? Um, and the first thing that I tell folks and kind of when I meet with clients one on one is just that don't feel like this has to be done alone. Right? Energy manager can't you know, energy management can't be done alone uh, really effectively. Right. I think it can be guided by a point person. I think you do need to have kind of a leader driving the ship, if you will. But it does require everyone's effort. Uh, and when you can find and empower a team of staff and stakeholders who are passionate about conservation, that's when you're really going to multiply your savings. Uh, so this is a critical step when you start implementing an energy saving program and a campaign is just identifying, you know, who else in our organization uh, want, wants to be a part of this. Um, so, so things like finding energy stewards. And, and one of the things that I always suggest, you know, many of the folks on the call are part of maintenance departments. Uh, facility management departments, uh, sustainability departments. I think a great place to start is within that department. 
this may be something if you're a facility manager that you begin to implement a culture of efficiency with your maintenance technicians. You know, things that you kind of schedule in, almost like planned maintenance activities. Uh, schedule in things like uh, just building walkthroughs. You know, hey, quarterly uh, technicians, we're going to walk through buildings and we're just going to document things that, uh, that are areas of opportunity for savings. Uh, do we have a lot of things plugged in after hours? Uh, do we have, um, you know, have we, have we looked at our building controls and audited our controls lately to make sure that the schedules are still what they need to be, um, you know, for occupant comfort? Do they still meet, um, you know, guidelines for, uh, for health or for airflow or whatever it may be? Uh, and, I, and I would say once we've identified these folks, maybe kind of pilot it with our maintenance teams, uh, we want to empower folks to lead as well. <clears throat> so those things like assigning quarterly walkthroughs, um, you know, those things can be assigned to maintenance technicians, but maybe you've got a, a finance person that wants to get involved, or maybe you've got a nurse, or, or maybe you've got uh, residents, right, you know, within senior living uh, that, that want to be a part of this. Uh, so don't, don't feel like it has to be another hat that you wear. I think getting folks involved is a very important step, as well as things like newsletters, memos. Uh, and that's one of the, the fun things that I've seen recently <clears throat> is just this idea of uh, communicating need and bringing others in. And it could be things like, you know, uh, if it's on an intranet or you've got kind of like flyer or poster boards and hallways or things like that, uh, how can we put information up? Uh, so, you know, I'm an outdoor light bulb. This is what it costs to leave me on, or this is what it costs if I'm a, a 50 horsepower motor. Um, these are the savings that we can find if we act. Really just kind of putting, um, you know, savings and intangible, uh, you know, uh, comparing them to tangible things. Um, but the, the, the most fun thing that I saw was kind of this middle portion. It's just a volunteer opportunity, you know, a great way to kind of build that, that green team or just get others involved uh, is just to, to create that event. Uh, now, this is an idea. It's not something that it might be uh, applicable to everyone, uh, but it was a pretty fun idea, uh, and it's a great way just to identify waste uh, in facilities. So moving, moving forward, you know, we've talked about clarity, taking a snapshot of where we're at, uh, looking at data, you know, helping that kind of drive decision making. Uh, we've talked about bringing others on board. Hey, we've got this data. Let's look at it together. What can we do? How can we, how can we act? Um, this third C, conservation, is really just putting a plan behind that. You know, looking at the data, these are things that, you know, stuff like, hey, let's create some year-over-year -year goals <clears throat> or, you know, uh, and we've seen this a lot. It could be like, hey, we want to be carbon neutral by 2050 or we want to see a 2% savings uh, in our usage year over year, right? We're just setting uh, achievable, uh, you know, sustainable goals that we can shoot towards uh, to make sure that whatever efforts that we implement uh, are things that can be repeated, kind of rinsed and, and reused year over year. Um, so not, not too much to talk about in this stage other than the fact of put your ideas on paper, you know, get buy-in from uh, executive leadership, get buy-in from the board, it doesn't have to be something massive, right? But creating conservation goals yields, uh, you know, abundant fruit. It's, it's great brand awareness. Uh, it's positive publicity. Uh, it's going to increase patient satisfaction. It's going to extend the life of your assets and reduce energy costs. And those are just kind of the, the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, but the idea is use your energy management data use that information that you gleaned from, from step one of clarity to really set some initiatives. Um, so again, some action items here, determine what energy data and reports you need for tracking and trending towards these conservation goals, and then establish a regular cadence for reports to be pulled and shared uh, to show what progress uh, you've made and, and, and what are the ways that you can improve. Once you've kind of set those goals, right, I want to, I, I want to slide on over to a, a probably pretty familiar area uh, when we talk about energy management and reduction. Um, you know, once we set goals, now it's how can we achieve them, right? If, if we've, uh, you know, going all the way back to step one, right, we, we've got clarity, we know where we're, we're wasting dollars, where we're wasting resources. Uh, I've kind of uh, brought together a team 
uh, to, to look at this data with us and help us, you know, step three, set some goals. Now that I've done that, how can we act? Um, and again, there's a thousand and one things that we can do when it comes to energy management. This is probably the most familiar, right? Things like capital projects. Uh, and those are things, I mean, we've, we've probably implemented a lot of them. Um, you know, everything from kind of the low hanging fruit of LEDs, uh, to kind of the big things like new uh, energy efficient chillers uh, to, to solar technologies or renewable technologies. Uh, so again, it's probably the most common avenue organizations take, uh, and it should be what you do at minimum, but not exclusively. And what I mean is I've heard a lot of folks say, yeah, we're, we're really great. Uh, you know, our energy management plan is solely focused on capital upgrades. We want to have the newest, we want to have the best infrastructure. And that's great, right? I, I don't want to diminish, diminish that, and I don't want to say don't do that. Um, but it's interesting. I had a, had a conversation with a client the other day. We've got a brand new hospital that that's just uh, uh, finished. Uh, they've just finished construction. Uh, they're going to move into it, uh, but there's no plan to really monitor the energy consumption once that facility comes online. Uh, and that's interesting to me because I think we all know once a building comes online, it feels like all it's trying to do is waste waste uh, uh, energy. It doesn't it doesn't care that the lights are on all the time. It doesn't care if you know our HVAC set points you know remain the same at one o'clock in the morning as they are at twelve noon. All right, it has to be told what to do. And so if we're not monitoring that you know this brand new energy efficient facility is running as it should it's just gonna run. Um, and so it's very important, uh, even though we are doing capital upgrades to also continue to track and kind of follow this trust but verify method of, you know, is this facility meeting the savings or are these assets that we've installed or is this solar generation that we've brought online, is it meeting the, the savings that we thought it would? Um, we could probably have an entire webinar dedicated to, to capital projects and things that you could do. Uh, but I do want to touch briefly on some best practice. So, so number one, uh, let data drive your planning, not gut feel or not just, you know, ribbon cutting type uh, type initiatives. Um, let data drive where the need is uh, and not just energy data. You should be looking at your maintenance history alongside of your utility bills to understand you know, equipment repair versus replace decisions. <clears throat> you know, on the surface, you may have, you know, looking in your work order system to say, hey, we've, you know, we've increased our, our critical work orders on, you know, this air handler unit by 50% this year. It's dying. We need to replace it. Well, that may be true, uh, but if you look at kind of other data sets to look at energy efficiencies of all of our equipment, it may make more sense to replace a, a, a different piece of equipment or other pieces of equipment as well. So you should be looking at other data sets. Um, for projects like LED um, or even renewables, uh, I, I've, I've seen a lot of folks have success running pilot programs first. So, uh, you know, solar is one of those things that, uh, again, it's great PR. Um, you know, it's good in terms of kind of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, but what's interesting about solar is it's still not very efficient in terms of converting, you know, uh, the sun's power into usable energy. Uh, and we're still kind of relying on some federal grants and some other local grants, utility grants to kind of make it make sense from a financial perspective. And sometimes it still doesn't make sense. Um, so, so things like LEDs or renewables, um, let's do a pilot program first, maybe make sure that the use case is there. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks recently say, hey, you know, in 2008, when there was a lot of rebates, it made a lot of sense for us to kind of do these big capital projects uh, for our LED and kind of convert everything at one time. Now, some of that money is drying up. So they're implementing, you know, policies that say, hey, when bulbs and ballast fail, that's when we're going to, you know, replace with LED. Same thing with like motor replacement strategies. So pilot programs are great. Um, but then to that point, always, always, always check with utilities for rebates. Do a quick Google search for grants in your area. I mean, the bottom line is it's free money. So make sure that when we're doing capital projects, we are looking for some of that free money. Uh, and then fourthly, consider alternative funding sources like performance contracts. Um, performance contracts are generally pretty popular in the public arena. 
uh, but they are, uh, you know, are popular in the private arena as well. Um, so consider those funding sources like performance contracts that say, listen, uh, you know, it may not make more sense for you to tie up uh, a lot of your capital funding in one project now. Uh, so maybe do a guaranteed kind of pay by performance type type contract that says, hey, you know, the total savings of this chiller replacement are going to cover the cost of the replacement over a 10 or 20 year period. Um, the the last bullet point here that that I want to touch on as, as we kind of kind of wrap up into the, this five C's here uh, would be communication. Uh, and actually, as I talk about this, I, I'm going to I'm going to switch the slide back here to to kind of this first screen uh, that we looked at. Um, I, I book in, you know, the five C's with clarity and communication intentionally. Uh, the reason being is if we do these steps right on the front and the back end, a lot of the stuff in the middle falls into place, especially as we kind of rinse and repeat. And what I mean is we, we need to have clarity in our data to help drive, you know, what goals we're going to set, what capital investments we're going to make, what operational changes we're going to make. We also need communication to make sure that's a repeatable process. And what I mean is in this communication phase, right, this is where I see many organizations fail. We get the funding for a project, uh, we get board approval to do something, and then we just assume that it's gonna meet the expectations that we have. And a lot of times it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And I know that sounds silly, but it's very important to be able to measure and verify and report on the success of projects or conservation measures. Um, and it's, you know, this lack of, of communication is either due to lack of knowledge, uh, lack of resources, lack of tools available to communicate, uh, but one of the best ways to get funding for future projects is to show the success and savings of past initiatives. So it's all about maintaining this momentum. One of the great ways to continue, you know, this con this uh, culture of conservation, if you will, is to continually report on the success that you're having. So you should be able to communicate at any time to your board, to your stakeholders, to your citizens, uh, to your residents. Uh, not only, you know, the reduction in use, but also how that translates to dollars saved. It's going to provide confidence and validation to things that you do moving forward with your decision makers. Uh, and it can also guide you towards which projects are more effective than others uh, or what your next energy saving project should be. Uh, so some of the action items there, uh, establish a baseline year so that you can compare data pre and post project. Uh, normalize the data for multiple variables, right? Your weather, your occupancy, any square footage changes that you've made. Uh, there's software that can help do this. Um, you know, there's a lot of great resources in terms of this measurement and verification and, and setting baseline year. Um, and even as a communication to, or uh, as a continuation rather, to, to this communication, um, be transparent uh, around your energy program with stakeholders. Again, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just like the front end, we, we want to be real uh, and we want to be transparent, um, you know, to your board, your administration, to your peers. Um, I, I've seen folks really translate savings into meaningful measurements, you know, things like the savings from this project was X, and that's equivalent to Y new staff, or the savings from this project will allow us to do A, B, and C. Um, this increases patient satisfaction, and it's, it's really the responsibility of every member of the health care organization uh, to make sure that they communicate how how energy reduction plays a role. Uh, so some of the things that I've got on the screen here, again, just report the doing, uh, but some some best practice uh, establishing automated cadences. So these can be reports that are automatically you know sent out monthly, quarterly, yearly, wh whatever the frequency needs to be. Uh, they can be emailed newsletters. Uh, they can be you know read only dashboards. Um, you know, things that stay on websites or things that stay on rotating screens throughout your organization, uh, but it's just a, a, a regular cadence and a regular rhythm of information. Uh, and then kind of the final point, uh, I, I probably should have bolded this, um, but just executive support um, is really huge. Uh, they're not a healthcare organization, but um, Exxon Mobil back in the late 90s, early 2000s, they really honed in on this last bullet point with their energy management program. And of course, they're, a, they're an international organization, um, but they really found that any time uh, executive team or leadership at any level, any management personnel 
uh, sent short memos, right, or, or sent out short newsletters about how important uh, energy management and energy reduction was for their organization, uh, they saw an increase in savings, an increase in folks really caring and paying attention. So, uh, again, it may be something from your CFO or your COO, uh, something simple that says, hey, this is a priority for us in 2020. Everybody do their best. Uh, it really gives kind of all your stakeholders and peers that confidence that, that you're going to have the support that, that you need. Um, so again, you know, Kristen, to your point, uh, yes, these slides will be available. Um, you know, we're going to send it out to you as well as, uh, as well as the recording that, that you can kind of, uh, look back on it. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of leave, uh, this slide here for a couple of seconds, just to reframe what we talked about. Um, the five C's of energy management, clarity, culture, conservation, capital, and communication, uh, a scalable process. And that's what we want to leave you with is just whether you're day one into your energy management journey or, you know, year 10, right? This is something that you should be able to implement uh, at, at any given point. So um, before we kind of really dive into the Q&A section, uh, we're going to pop up a poll question. And it's really just a way that we can get some information back to you uh, on the call. Um, if you want some further information uh, or you want to talk with, with someone uh, at Dude Solutions about you know, controlling your utility cost or streamlining your workflow. Um, just let us know. Uh, we'll reach out to you. We won't be uh, invasive by, by any stretch of the imagination. Awesome. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, we're going to keep the poll open for just a few seconds here uh, while we kind of dive into the Q&A uh, for today's presentation. I've had a couple good questions come in, so we'll go ahead and tee those up for Dan while we leave the poll up here for a few more seconds. Um, Dan, knowing that there's a lot of things you can focus on when trying to reduce energy waste, um, what are some of the more practical or simple things that you recommend people look for in buildings um, when they're initially kind of starting out? Yeah, thanks, Earl. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so I'm actually going to pull. Um, I've got a. Uh, I've got a, a screenshot that it just it just triggered in my mind, uh, Earl, when when you asked that question. Um, that I'm going to I'm going to share out here and let's see if I can zoom in to make sure that everyone can can read it. Um, it doesn't look like it. I'll, I'll send this. Um, I'll send this slide out. I don't think everybody's going to be able to read it, um, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll send it out when we send out information. Um, but this this came from a study uh, that was done. A lot of uh, different organizations participated in just kind of what are the top energy conservation measures. Um, and it's just a percentage of participants. I think there were over 100 organizations that participated with the Better Buildings Challenge. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to touch on the top few when, when you ask that question. Um, the, the, the number one area that most folks looked at immediately, knowing there's a lot of ways that you can start, are just improving the scheduling for your HVAC. Uh, so that may be done kind of on uh, with newer technology, you know, newer building automation controls and dashboards, you can really kind of fine tune those set points, uh, fine tune those schedules, or if you're still kind of working with programmable thermostats, it's the same same concept It may just be a little bit more manual. Uh, but this is the number one thing that, that you can do. Um, you know, your HVAC is going to make up about 70% of your load. Uh, so just scheduling, um, you know, how cool or how warm a facility is throughout the day. We do this at our home all the time, or we should be. Uh, but that's going to be your 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 best place to look. Um, same things like adjusting the temperature set points. Um, the third one, and I'll kind of pause here and 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 can send this out, and you guys can can look at it uh, individually. It would just be uh, reducing simultaneously heating and cooling. Um, and I know that that probably feels like most folks say, well, we don't heat and cool uh, at the same time. We're, we're not that type of organization. Um, it's incredible how often this happens. Uh, I was teaching a, a seminar uh, out in uh, California uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was at a large uh, sports arena. I won't, I won't throw out any names, uh, but it was fascinating to me that uh, within a span of 30 minutes in the uh, conference room that we were in for, for this webinar, this meeting room, within a span of 30 minutes, we had both heated and cooled that space at the same time uh, because uh, the room wasn't scheduled for occupants. Uh, so it was a great, obviously, you know, talking point to say, hey, even in this room that we're in, uh, we have heated and cooled at the same time uh, simply because we, we don't have the right, right control set up. 
so that, that's kind of how I'd answer that, Earl. There, there's a lot of things that we could do, but really focusing on HVAC um, first, um, you know, tends to be some pretty good low hanging fruit. No, awesome context there, Dan. Thank you. Um, one last question we'll get to here that just um, popped in. A uh, really good one around um, misconceptions. Um, what are some common misconceptions that you see regarding energy man management in general, Dan, since you're so closely tied to, to that? Yeah. Um, so I, I think um, – I think there's two that, that popped to mind just as a kind of verbal process, this question, and it's a great question, whoever submitted it. Um, the first one that we, we touched on, well, we've touched on both of them, but the first one is just that, uh, gosh, to be able to do this well, uh, I've got to almost, uh, you know, take on another full-time role, right? So if you're a facility manager uh, or, you know, uh, an operations manager, Right, the idea that if I'm going to do this well, I've got to put on another hat called energy manager to really focus on this, you know, day in and day out. Uh, and I would just say that that's not true. I think there are some very simple best practices that you can implement, um, you know, to, to make sure that, hey, yeah, you're looking at data, but it's not consuming, you know, four to six hours of your day. Um, you know, things like automating reports, uh, and those those reports can just be, a comparison of your utility cost and consumption this month versus last month or this month versus the same month last year, you know, have some, some type of energy management system or even a spreadsheet that, that kind of keeps that information in front of you um, will at least help you identify waste that's happening before it becomes, you know, a problem that's, that's reoccurred every month for the last six months. And you don't know because you haven't seen the data. Um, I think, to, to piggyback off of that point would just be kind of uh, honing in on that culture step, you know, step two of culture. There are people in your organizations that care um, and that want to help, right? It doesn't have to be a siloed process that says I manage energy alone. There are folks that will look at data as well. Uh, there, are, uh, there are folks that, that really care. So, so I would say that's probably the biggest misconception is that it, it's going to take a, a ton of time to be able to make some, um, you know, to see some, some achievable results. Uh, I would say the, the second misconception <clears throat> would probably be that um, I, I have a fear of asking, you know, administration or management for more resources. Because um, I think in the same way, energy is one of those things that has a payback by nature. It's, it's a, uh, you know, probably the private industry does this better than any other in terms of using savings from energy projects and rolling those back into more projects, so kind of a reinvestment or a revolving fund. Uh, the private industry does it well. And so just communicating with, um, with leadership to say, hey, listen, <clears throat> if I can save, I'm gonna make something up. If I can save you know, $30,000 a year or even $10,000 a year uh, in utility cost, what do you wanna do with that? And they, you know, well, let's do this and, and say, well, listen, you know, now that you say that, this is something that can reoccur, right? We, we put some initiatives behind this to say energy reduction is important for us. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, COOs and CFOs really get behind that and say, yes, let's, let's create some of these revolving investment funds and, and really maintain this going forward. So um, the, the fear of communicating with, with leadership is, is probably the second one. <clears throat> That's great. Great context, Dan. Really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, appreciate your time today. Uh, again, walking everybody through uh, the webinar. Um, really good stuff. Like Dan mentioned uh, earlier, we will follow up with you after the webinar and make sure you get a copy of the slides. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions that have come in, so we'll go ahead and wrap uh, this up a little bit early and give you guys some time uh, back in your day. appreciate all you uh, joining us. Uh, no things are a little crazy right now uh, out there, so I hope everybody has a great, um, you know, great rest of your week. Stay uh, safe, uh, stay healthy out there, and we'll uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.